So I'm a consultant radiologist with pediatric interest based in London. So I've been there for 30 years. Um, I developed an interest in artificial intelligence. And I can see there are lots of youngsters here. So I'm assuming that I don't have to take you through the basics. So I'm going to start straight. We'll go jump. And also, please mind you, I'm not a technocrat. I'm not a, 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 an IT person. So I'm just a simple radiologist. So bear with me if my lecture sounds too non-technical. But I'm going to give you the clinical perspective. So obviously, I have no personal interest in any of the products which I'll be showing you. So obviously, we see that the impact of AI is in medicine is not just in medicine. It's in every sphere of our life, particularly radiology. I'm just going to read out the ones in yellow, because uh, you can see that improving diagnostics, personalized treatment plans, Predictive analytics, it tells you what's going to happen next. Clinical decision support, it helps the doctor to take a decision. Drug discovery, there's a lot of role in chemotherapy. Deep learning algorithms, it's the same thing, but now we are picking up lung cancer quite early, breast cancer, brain tumors, prostate cancer. CAD, it's just like a lot used in breast. We have our top Google people here. so. They are the ones who came up with the software, CAD, for breast cancer. AI in MRI and CT scans and radiomix. So radiomix is nothing but AI combining with radiology. So this is all we have, the different areas, the different language models in AI and how it is implemented, how it is incorporated into medicine. And this is quite a you know, a mind-blowing chart, but you can see that there are so many different softwares available, so the hospitals are spoiled for choice, but at the same time, it's very difficult to make the right choice, depends, because machine learning and deep learning, it depends on what product it has been tried on, because if you're training a particular brand or a particular device, then, you know, that probably works well with that particular device, not work very well with the other device. So. One of the reasons why AI is not being able to, you know, why they're not able to implement AI into real life scenarios, although we have so many softwares out there, and this message is clearly for all the IT people, all the engineers who are bombarding the doctors with all these softwares. So it's a very clear message is please ensure that the doctors are not confused. They don't get confused with too much of information, technical information. Make it simple for us. Tell us how it's going to help our clinical practice. Tell us how it's going to change the outcome. Tell us how it's going to change the patient care. So these are the different organs. As you can see, I'm based in London. So we, base, we work based on systems rather than modality. So we don't go by CT, ultrasound, MRI. We go by systems, so neurology, urology, gynecology, musculoskeletal, pediatrics. So we go like that. And for everything, Nowadays, we have different softwares, which we are starting now. Slowly, we are starting to apply. But the problem with you know, applying with these softwares, it's, it's still not uniform, number one. There are other issues which uh, I'm going to elaborate. What are the other issues? So you can see that you know, AI is not going to replace radiologists. It's not going to replace doctors. I can tell you that very clearly. There's a big apprehension all over the world. A lot of doctors hate AI. I know that. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I'm sure at least 60% of you don't like it, but sadly, we have to accept it because change is the only constant thing in life, right? Now, faster analysis, it helps us a lot because when you have a huge workload, it helps us. Then errors, it reduces errors, there's no doubt about it. I have been practicing AI for the last five years, clinical practice, and it has helped me a lot. It has prevented me from making some serious mistakes. And then flagging rare pathologies, which a human eye, because the resolution of the human eye is very different from the AI resolution. And you can see this, how it's analyzing the automated images and makes a very early diagnosis, like picking up early breast cancer, tumors as small as four or five millimeters in the lungs. And it's a very good assistant to radiologists. And then workflow optimization. Also, it controls the workflow. So it is useful in functional imaging. You know that functional imaging is anything that discusses physiology. So we have uh, you know, SPECT scan, positron emission scan, 
we have functional MRI. Then wearables, all these, you know, the mobile devices, are iPhones, the watches, everything is AI, right? Nowadays, it's monitoring your heart. You wear a wristwatch, it tells you what's your blood pressure, how much more you can jog. So, and uh, these are like hyper-personalized biomarkers, which is very useful for cancer. And quantum imaging and AI fusion, but that's the future. So I don't want to go into that, but that's very promising. That's a massive area in itself. So is it a friend? Yes, I would say that it's a friend. I'm not too sure how many of you would agree, but augments human expertise, so it does not replace it. It helps us, increases, you know, extend far remote places. In Australia, they use a lot to the remote places where there's no service and no doctors. Um, reduces costs, improves outcomes. So combine the two, that's the best outcome. 